Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Minister, and to the officials. Minister, we learned at the public inquiry on foreign interference that your cabinet colleague, Bill Blair, while he served in your current role as Minister of Public Safety, sat on a CSIS warrant for 54 days. National security officials testified at the inquiry that such a warrant is typically signed off by the minister in only a handful of days. And suspiciously, the target of the warrant was none other than a former Ontario Liberal cabinet minister and key organizer and fundraiser for Justin Trudeau in the GTA. So why did it take 54 days to sign the warrant? Mr. Chair, through you, uh, Mr. Cooper, that's uh, an interesting question. I was asked a similar question at the public inquiry. Uh, I was not the Minister of Public Safety. I have not seen that warrant. I can't speak to the circumstances around that warrant at all. Um, and in fact, I was told by CSIS, and the director is here, that I'm not even allowed to discuss the existence of a particular warrant, although that one, as you know, uh, is already in the public domain. So I'm not in a position to address any of the circumstances around that particular warrant. I wasn't involved M at all. Minister, will you launch a departmental review into what happened as far as this 54-day delay? Uh, I look forward to hearing uh, Justice uh, Ugg's conclusions with respect to this issue. I think the bureaucratic term is it was well ventilated at the public inquiry. Well, minister, the judge may minister, have some... Aren't you concerned that there was this... 54-day delay in your department, uh, slow walking for 54 days, a national security investigation. Doesn't that cause you concern? I have a lot of confidence in the work done by CSIS and their national security partners. I regularly have briefings on warrants that I'm asked CSIS, to sign. CSIS went to the minister's chief of staff after no action was taken on day 13. After the minister's chief of staff was briefed, the minister continued to sit on that warrant for all the way to 54 days. Uh, isn't the real reason that you're unwilling to undertake a departmental review is because you know that Bill Blair and his chief of staff put the partisan interests of the Liberal Party ahead of national security. Isn't that why you're so disinterested? Absolutely not, Mr. Cooper. You can make up a series of uh, suppositions and allegations here. Uh, you have... Why not undertake a review? Again, Mr. Cooper, these are amongst the most sensitive uh, intelligence instruments that CSIS and the Public Safety Department have. I've never heard of an internal departmental review with respect to a specific warrant. The department provides me advice with respect to every warrant that I'm asked to sign. And again, I've taken note because I have no information well, it's, myself. It's, it's really Mr. Quite Chair, un Mr. Mr. Cooper asked a order, question. Huh? Yeah, Chair, so point of order. Maybe there the member from Matlock so would allow me to answer the question. Minister, I got a couple things happening here. So here, here, here's what I've got. I've got uh, some interrupting, and I'm going to ask Mr. Cooper to afford the minister the opportunity to finish. I've got the minister taking an opportunity to himself provide some remarks, and then I've got a point of order from Mr. Turnbull, which I presume is in relation to what I've just said, and if uh, that's the case, perhaps, Mr. Turnbull, we can just uh, continue unless you feel the need to speak to this uh, more specifically. All right. Uh, I pause the clock. Uh, minister, I'm going to turn the floor back over to you, and I, I'm not even going to start the clock again for just a few seconds, to be fair here. Uh, allow you to answer Mr. Cooper's question. There's two minutes and 40 seconds remaining once I start the clock. Minister, the floor is yours. So, Mr. Chair, thank you. And as I said, I have no personal insight into that particular warrant. I've taken note of public comments where Mr. Blair indicated that he signed that very quickly uh, when he himself became aware of that warrant. I think Director Vigno, the former okay. director of CSIS, Minister, also Minister, noted... Minister, Minister... Oh, so, sorry, Mr. Chair, is there a problem on, on your uh, left? Minister, I'll I'll handle the uh, uh, the, the the ongoings. Uh, I'm going to well, permit chair, you with, about five. Mr. Chair, with I've, great I've, respect, it's my time. First of all, Mr. First of all, Mr. Cooper, you don't have the floor. Second of all, I've paused the clock. Minister, in about ten seconds, if you can wrap that up, please, and then I'm going to start the clock again. 
to be fair to Mr. Cooper and allow him the opportunity to continue with his line of questioning. Go ahead, Mr. Mr. Chair, thank you. I would just draw the committee's attention and Mr. Cooper's attention to public comments that I had noted from former Director Vigno about his level of comfort in terms of the time that this has taken. But uh, my only insight into that are public comments I've seen. But we look forward, of course, to Justice Hogg's uh, addressing this issue should she decide to do so. Did Bill Blair, his chief of staff, or anyone in the minister's office tip off the former Ontario Liberal cabinet minister that he was a target of a CSIS warrant? Again, uh, I congratulate Mr. Cooper on your fishing expedition. I was Minister of Fisheries and Oceans myself. I understand uh, that kind of activity. Um, I, again, Mr. Chair, have no insight into that. I would, of course, well, I, Mr. I would Cooper no, I would being... No, I would note, Minister, that PMO officials were caught tipping off the member for Don Valley North, or at least he was tipped off, and the only person uh, persons briefed were officials uh, within the PMO who had national security clearances. So it's happened before. So I put it to you again. How can you be certain that the former Liberal cabinet minister was not tipped off after a long 54-day delay when you haven't even bothered to undertake a review? Again, there's no evidence, uh, Mr. Cooper, of what you just alleged around PMO officials tipping off MPs. Well, then just undertake a review. Uh, Why not clear the air and undertake a review? 54 days of delay to protect this liberal kingpin. Again, Mr. Co Mr. Cooper, those are your suppositions, and I get that you're doing this so you can have nice clips for social media. It doesn't mean that what you're saying is, in fact, accurate or real. Well, it is accurate that there was an unprecedented 54-day delay involving a national security investigation that was slow walk that just happened to concern a former liberal cabinet minister and key organizer and fundraiser for the prime minister. Just a coincidence? Well, what is a coincidence is that you keep making up things, for example, that somebody tipped off this particular well, I asked individual. You, I asked you, do you, point do of you order, have any information in that regard? Can you provide can, the assurance can, that Mr. that didn't Mr. happen? Mr. Cooper, I've got a point of order. Uh, Ms. O'Connell. Chair, for the, out of respect of interpreters, it's incredibly difficult to have two people speaking at one time. The member opposite can ask his questions and then allow time for a response, or else we're not going to have interpretation and they'll lose their time altogether. So I think it would suit everyone to allow that respect here. Uh, colleagues, I would uh, tend to agree with Ms. O'Connell here. We do have to be respectful of the fact that we've got interpreters trying to do work um, uh, that serves us and the public interest. Uh, I have uh, tried to be very fair in pausing the clock here in order to not allow points of order to take away. However, at some point, uh, we're going to have to keep going. Otherwise, uh, uh, the minister is going to have to go back to Montreal and get himself a Schwartz sandwich for lunch. So, uh, Cooper, the floor is yours for 20 seconds. Minister, again, why not undertake a review? Mr. Chair, uh, the deputy informs me that there have never been reviews around the particular issue of a specific warrant. There's a well-known process by law uh, in terms of how these warrants are handled. We think that Justice Hugg, who has ventilated this issue in public hearings, uh, and perhaps in in-camera hearings, I don't know, uh, would uh, be in a best position, the best position to offer uh, views on this. Um, but again, Mr. Chair, I think it's important to note Mr. Cooper made a series of assertions about uh, people potentially tipping off somebody oh, minister, who was the... Minister, okay, thank you're you're mis thank you, Minister. mischaracterizing Mr. what Coop I said, Mr. Minister. Cooper, you're you mischaracterizing Mr. Mr. what Mr. I said. I asked you whether you could provide Michael. assurance that that didn't happen, and you have been unable to provide an answer in that regard. Okay. Mr. Cooper, you will be respectful of the role that I have to play as the chair of this committee to keep order. I have on three occasions this morning paused the clock, which is not common practice, in order to allow you to continue a line of questioning when you yourself have interrupted the minister. Your time was up. I provided the minister with an opportunity to respond, which is why we fought tooth and nail to have him here in the first place. So the clock has run on your opening line of questioning, and I would ask that the next time I open up the microphone to ask you to be respectful of my role as chair that you do that.
in the past. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Thank you all for being here, Minister. Just following up on what Mr. Bertold had said, he suggested that you, d as Public Safety Minister, because you don't prosecute and lay charges, that somehow you're unaware of the laws. Could you complete your thought on that? Because I found that quite disturbing that the Conservative Party somehow thinks the Minister of Public Safety is also the prosecutor and judge uh, should be kind of foretelling for what Conservatives think the role of a Public Safety Minister is. So, Ms. O'Connell, thank you for that question. I, too, was surprised that that seems to be uh, the approach that they offered up. But I actually, I, not to correct a senior parliamentarian like you, Ms. O'Connell, but they also think I should be the investigator. So one would investigate the case, prosecute your own case, and come to a conclusion. And then if you say you're not willing to do that, to say, well, you're not an expert in Canada's security law, uh, feels rather amateur as an approach. Um, but, Ms. O'Connell, I, I think that what's interesting, and our Deputy Minister and I, the Director just uh, confirmed this, the very existence of a threat reduction measure. Again, Mr. Bertold confused Mr. Chong's uh, interview with uh, CSIS officials. Um, these are undertaken in the judgment. The Director of CSIS can approve a threat reduction measure within his authorities. I have total confidence that they do this in an entirely appropriate way. And there's a very narrow, rare category of high-risk threat reduction measures uh, for which I'm asked to provide approval. Um, but we don't actually discuss those particular threat reduction measures or those meetings. Some people, in my, this is my view, I'm not speaking obviously for the public servants, but I think it's somewhat irresponsible to receive that and then to go talk about it in the House of Commons. Because the reason one gets that confidential, highly sensitive, in many cases, threat reduction briefing is to reduce the threat as opposed to uh, parade around in front of a television camera. So that's just my, I don't think that's entirely consistent with best practices in terms of national security. Thank you. And thank you for explaining to those who are uh, trying to mislead the public on your role in these matters. I do want to move a little bit to something that is critically important to me and frankly I think all parliamentarians and that's MP safety or parliamentarian safety which includes our staff and those working on the Hill. We've seen recently a number of incidents involving you know protesters and everyone has a right to protest but when it crosses the line I want to speak a little bit about your role keeping in mind that we have different layers in the sense of uh, parliamentary Protective Services, we have Ottawa Police here in the precinct, and then when we're in our ridings, we have local police that would have a responsibility. So I want to specifically ask about your role. Even just yesterday, I saw one of our parliamentary colleagues being escorted across the street while people screamed at her, the PPS can't save you, you better bring in the RCMP, which I found as a direct threat of intimidation. And I want to have a serious conversation about that. While Mr. Cooper goes to happy hour with some of these folks, I think it's mm -hmm. crucially important that we and all parliamentarians take this matter seriously. So within your mandate, recognizing that there are several uh, police jurisdictions, what are you doing and what is your department doing to help ensure that there's safety for our elections and safety for parliamentarians and our staff that are working? Working in these spaces when there are threats like that that are frankly not being called out uh, by the leader of the opposition and as I've mentioned in fact are having drinks with them. Uh, Minister about 35 seconds. Sure. Ms. O'Connell you raise a very uh, important issue. I know you've done a lot of work in this area as have a number of colleagues. I uh, am deeply concerned about the rise of threats and intimidation uh, and hate speech directed at uh, people who step forward to serve uh, their constituents and their country. 
Um, I too, I walk around Parliament Hill. I walk back and forth to the hotel where I stayed in my office in the Confederation Building. I see some of those same people with their megaphones. I sort of hope their batteries would die. Uh, it's going to get colder. The batteries don't last as long in the cold weather. Yelling uh, really offensive things, and they tend to focus uh, much of this vile on women, on racialized people. I understand that this circumstance is a problem. The sergeant at arms is uh, doing, in our view, a very important job in this area. The RCMP work with them. Um, we gave, as a department, many millions of dollars to the Ottawa police to take responsibility, and I see our colleague from Ottawa, Vanier, was involved in that effort, too, around the security of Wellington Street. But perhaps in, in, in subsequent questions, I, I, have, I share your concern. We have done a lot to increase, as has Parliament itself, but I think we all need to be thinking about what more we can do. Heaven forfend that there's uh, a violent or a very unfortunate incident. I worry about that every day. Uh, Madame Michaud, c'est à vous pour deux minutes. Since 2015, total violent crime in Canada is up 49.84%. This is my, my numbers. This is Statistics Canada. Homicides are up, uh, as of last year, 43%. Gang-related homicides are up 78% as of last year. Total sexual assaults up 74%. Total violent firearms offenses, which is use of, discharge, or pointing a gun, are up 116% since 2015. Extortion is up 357% since 2015. Auto theft is up 45%. Minister, I was there uh, when you and your cabinet colleagues voted for Bill C-75, voted for Bill C-20, or C-21. And one of those, uh, and C-5 as well, one of the offenses, um, which are one of the, uh, the, uh, the impacts of voting for the legislation that your government has tabled was to reduce minimum penalties for a number of offenses. One of them was actually extortion with a firearm, the mandatory minimum penalty of four years. That was uh, the initiative that your government had, that you voted for, and in your home province, of uh, New Brunswick. Extortion is up 301%. Why do you continue to pursue an agenda that goes after law-abiding firearms owners instead of an agenda that actually targets criminals and reduces crime on our streets? Well, Mr. Calkins, uh, thank you for the question. It won't surprise you that I don't share your view that uh, our agenda goes against law-abiding sports persons or firearms owners. Um, we certainly share the concern that you, I think, articulated that's shared by many Canadians around uh, recent incidents involving violent crime. Some of these extortion circumstances that uh, we've witnessed in recent months, if I uh, stick to the news conference of the Commissioner of the RCMP on Thanksgiving Monday, uh, some of this uh, uh, rise in extortion in the South Asian community, for example, the mayor of Edmonton has talked to me about it. Uh, the mayor of Brampton, uh, perhaps you're familiar, Patrick Brown, who was also a colleague of ours here in the House of Commons, has talked to me about this. Um, a lot of good work is being done by our law enforcement uh, authorities. They rely on partnerships with provinces and territories and municipal police forces. This work is done collaboratively. Um, I have uh, a great deal of confidence in that work, but I don't minimize the concern of Canadians. In my conversations with the Ontario Solicitor General, um, we try and figure out ways that we can work better together to bring down those very statistics that you spoke but, about. But, Minister, it's simply not true. Your government has spent millions of dollars to take away and confiscate the firearms, the lawfully owned property of vetted firearms owners across this country. Tens of millions of dollars have been spent so far. Millions more will have to be spent in order to achieve your goal to take property away from people who are simply not the problem. And yet your government has continued to pass legislation to make it easier for people to get out on bail, to make it easier for people to get out on parole. Even in the recent bill, I, I will applaud the fact that the only thing your government has done to unite the country is that the premiers of every province have written a letter saying that they would like you to change the bail or reverse the bail provisions that your government made in C-75. 
If you continue to focus on the wrong people, Minister, which is what you're focusing on right now, and I, I know this because I am intimately involved in the community. I am a hunter. I am an outdoorsman. I have actually been a law enforcement officer uh, in the conservation enforcement field. I deal with people with firearms all of the time. And they will tell me, and your Prime Minister has even said in interviews, that they're going to confiscate guns, some of the guns that are being used uh, by hunters. There's, there's nobody. Your leader is even being trolled by police associations when he celebrated the two-year uh, handgun freeze transfer, Toronto police, Vancouver police are basically saying that everything that your government is doing to reduce gun violence and the optics of going after law-abiding citizens is not working. When will you reverse course? When will you go to your leader and say reverse course, leave law-abiding citizens alone and let's focus on criminals, let's focus on the borders and keep Canadians safe? Minister, about uh, 25 seconds. Well, 25 seconds, because Mr. Cal uh, Calkin conflated a whole series of issues from uh, removing assault-style, military assault-style firearms. The, the firearms that Mr. were in Mr. our lockers Mr. four Calkins. or five years ago are still order. there. Mr. Calkins. They're still there. You Mr. haven't Calkins. banned anything, Minister. Mr. Turnbull, on a point of order. Well, it's the same thing here, running roughshod over the witnesses. If you wanted the minister to be here for two hours and he's come, it'd be nice if you gave him a chance to answer his question. Yeah, well, a, an answer would be helpful. The, the real tragedy here was I was just about to hold the, both the minister and Mr. Calkins up as a fantastic example of how we can have an exchange uh, without interruption. Uh, colleagues? Mr. Calkins, you took a good chunk of time uh, to ask the question. I'm going to give the minister a few seconds to respond. I'm going to ask colleagues that we try not to interrupt, and we'll be uh, out of this round before we know it. Minister, just give you a few seconds. Chair, so thank you, thank you uh, for uh, your indulgence. Um, Mr. Calkins conflated uh, bail reform. We also work with the provinces, and the House passed legislation, in fact, to provide reverse onuses on some violent repeat offenders in terms of their access to bail. He forgot that. A piece of it. Our government made a commitment in 2021 to remove assault style firearms from the streets of Canadians. Um, Mr. Calkins says he's a hunter. He knows a lot of people who are hunters. I know a lot of people who are law abiding gun owners as well, who are sports persons or go hunting. They don't normally go hunting with an assault style military firearm. Um, so uh, we think that it's in the public safety. I'm sorry, I'm hearing some background noise here, Mr. Yeah, Chair. Look, there, 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 I've given a great answer, and I'm happy to there, leave it at that. There is a bit of noise, Minister, but I was I was about to uh, cut you off anyway. So, uh, th thank you, Mr. Calkins. Mr. Chair, and thank you to the Minister for being here. I want to get into the details for Canadians to know exactly how this bill came together in full cooperation with the NDP. I don't want to get too personal, Minister, but do you remember this year on Valentine's Day who you had dinner with? I do. It was a very romantic moment. Uh, it, well, I'm, I live in New Brunswick. I was in Ottawa. My, I was away from, obviously, my family. Uh, and it was a February night, and we went to a great place called Colonnade Pizza. It's at the corner of Metcalf and Gilmore, and I went. It's great pizza. I would invite you to go. And I, my date for that evening was a, a great guy. You maybe remember him. Daniel Blakey was yes, his name. Yes, well, thank you. So he was, Daniel Blakey was the lead negotiator for the NDP on this bill. And as a matter of fact, he stood right behind you in March when you made the announcement and you and said on multiple occasions that this was, uh, this bill was part of the coalition to secure the continued support of the NDP. You even said at the uh, press conference that you gave in response, quote, the Prime Minister and Mr. Singh agreed to these important measures. Question, whose idea, was it a Liberal idea or an NDP idea to change the date of the election so that soon to be defeated, dozens of them, NDP and Liberal MPs would be guaranteed their pension. Liberal idea or NDP idea? Mr. Chair, you'll allow me to correct some of the falsehoods in the premise of that question. Uh, you referred to a coalition. I know your leader's office wants you to keep using that phrase. Uh, we don't have a coalition with the NDP. It's called a Sublime Confidence Agreement. Um, uh, Mr. Blake, he wasn't the lead negotiator. I'm surprised you're using union terms, Mr. Duncan. That's great to see the Conservative Party has embraced the labor movement. Um, Mr. Blakey was a partner with me 
as we developed uh, this legislation, something that our leaders agreed to transparently in a supply and confidence agreement that was posted on the internet. So I, I know that you look for secret sort of meetings. The meeting that the Valentine's Day dinner was so secret, we, we posted it on Twitter, uh, and our leader... So, Minister, here's, here's the thing, is that there were, we just got information minutes before this meeting start of, in fact, secret meetings that did play, take place only after Conservatives asked. We found information here that on January 25th, that the, there was NDP headquarters representatives that got a meeting with the Prime Minister's office, staff from your office in Elections Canada, to get information and briefings behind the scenes only revealed afterwards. Do you think it's appropriate that the NDP, not just MPs, on two different occasions, NDP party headquarters staff got access to the Prime Minister's office and to Elections Canada to get briefings that were not offered to any other party? I don't think Canadians find that very funny, and it was secret until we asked for details. Again, I, you're a very experienced sleuth here, Mr. Duncan. I would congratulate you for that investigative work. Um, uh, this is absolutely normal. So do I think it's appropriate? Absolutely. Do I think it's normal in a Westminster parliamentary system where there's a supply and confidence agreement? Of course it is. Um, these were routine meetings uh, of senior officials of the Privy Council office. Mr. Sutherland was in some of these meetings. I was in meetings with Mr. Sutherland and the chief electoral officer himself where Mr. Blakey was present, so we could understand the advice both of the Privy Council officials and Elections Canada as we worked together to develop this legislation. So you find it shocking that parliamentarians work together in a collaborative way. We think it's something that Canadians would find very positive. What Canadians would not find positive is that NDP party headquarters staff were invited and attended those meetings. That is completely inappropriate of what happened there, where one political party was given access to information and documents and crafted a bill. But I'll go back again. The whole point that now the NDP absolutely wants to ignore and forget about was the changing of the election date. Was it a Liberal idea or an NDP idea to move back the election by a week so it guarantees any defeated Liberal and NDP MPs their pension? Whose idea was it, the Liberals or the NDP? So again, uh, your very clever clip you just got for some post that you may do later, uh, but I think it's important for people to understand that pension entitlement had nothing to do with that decision to move the date. I'm lucky enough, I was elected in 2000, so it certainly wasn't my idea to be concerned about pension entitlement for myself. Um, we think that Diwali is an important uh, moment for a very significant community in Canada. There are municipal elections in the province of Alberta on that date. We worked with Elections Canada on a number of different scenarios of different dates. But as I said, Mr. Duncan, in order to reassure you that this, that the little premise of your question, which you fabricate, wasn't the case, we would welcome this committee's judgment in moving the date and would welcome that when you get to the clause by clause, feel free to work with colleagues if you're so outraged yep. and you want to explain why Diwali or the municipal elections in Alberta aren't important, yep. go ahead. But anytime you move yep. the date, you're going to bump into yes. a problem no, somewhere. And, and here's, the here's the thing, Minister, is that it's not about Diwali because what happened was when you moved it back a week, it then coincided with a territorial election in overlaps into Quebec. What you could have done was move the election earlier if that was truly the reason and it's not. It's about securing the pensions by giving the election happening a week later. People know that because even just last week we heard when we asked your own officials, why don't you call it earlier, including into the summer, and it was, quote, uh, the sorts of considerations that were made, you wouldn't want to break with summer holidays through Labor Day. That was the reason your officials said it didn't get moved earlier. So, Minister, I'll ask you, uh, you don't want to have an election that coincides through Labor Day. When was the last time that that happened? I, I haven't taken note of every election. Uh, I, I remember one. I remember one. Let, let me let me you answer for you. Either, either, either way, either way, the last either election. Either way, the prime minister way, called Mr. it when Duncan. it was opportunistic for him, and now suddenly you forget Duncan. when the last election was called. This is the, this is the second time now today that I have had members around this table not respond to my intervention, and you guys are going to flip out in 45 minutes from now, or 40 minutes from now, or 30 minutes from now, when I try to end this meeting because you say there wasn't enough time for the minister. 
respect the authority of the chair to try to operate the meeting in an effective and an efficient manner. Minister, there's no time left for a response. There's no time left for a question. Mr. Yours for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Minister, you have stated with respect to the clause in the bill that uh, pushes back the date of the next federal election that the reason for that was to uh, avoid a conflict with a holiday. You said that before you said it at committee, but the date that was selected conflicts with the territorial election in Nunavut. And the chief electoral officer came before this committee and indicated that that would significantly strain electoral resources in Nunavut. So you, you talked about the holiday being important. I agree it is important. I agree the Alberta municipal elections are important. Uh, but do you not think the territorial election in Nunavut is also important? And how, why is it that of all the dates that were chosen, you chose that specific date? So, Mr. Chair, Mr. Cooper, I think, identifies again something which I said is uh, an ongoing challenge with a fixed election date. Um, I hope Mr. Cooper in the House of Commons hasn't been using in any of his questions the silly phrase about time being up. Because, uh, Mr. Cooper, you would, of course, want to have an election right now, so you shouldn't be worried about a fixed election date uh, next October. But I'm glad you're turning well, your well, attention to that. In solving this, so, this problem, you've created another problem in terms of a date that conflicts with a territorial election, which will have an adverse impact on, on the territory in terms of conducting two elections on the same date. But, you know, Minister, it does solve one problem, a problem not that Canadians have, but a problem that NDP liberal politicians have, and that is that soon-to-be-defeated NDP and liberal MPs who would not qualify for their pension will suddenly collect their pension. They're going to pad their pockets. That's what the effect of it would be, is to pad the pockets of soon-to-be-defeated NDP Liberal MPs. Uh, the fact that you profess ignorance of that fact is only because you've been caught, and the fact that you're willing to back down is, again, because you've been caught. Canadians have realized that that is exactly what you did, or tried to do. So I'm going to put the question to you once again, a question you refused to answer when Mr. Duncan asked you, whose idea was it to pad your pockets? Was it your idea, or was it the leader of the NDP's idea? So, oh, congratulations, Mr. Cooper, on, on your clip. I hope you can get it up before the end Just of the meeting. Just answer the question. Um, in the premise to your question, you had a series of, again, I find it very arrogant, Mr. Chair, that one would say soon to be defeated MPs. I, I wouldn't purport to decide how the voters in Edmonton, St. Albert, will deal with Mr. Cooper in the next election. There's a certain arrogance, I think, from the Conservatives to say that, first of all, their members who would have, in, in their obsession with the pension focus, have benefited also. Uh, the idea that none of them might risk being defeated is the supreme arrogance, Minister, I find. Minister, answer the question, whose idea was it? Was it your idea? Was it the leader of the NDP's idea? I've asked you a very straightforward question. Answer the question. So, uh, Mr. Chair, we have explained uh, when we introduced the bill that we had worked on this bill uh, with the NDP caucus as uh, with, in the case it was Mr. Blakey, uh, with respect to an agreement that Mr. Singh and the Prime Minister made. Um, and we have noticed the manufactured indignation uh, from the Conservatives around this issue. I agree with Ms. Barron to perhaps uh, prevent them from dealing with what we think are substantive and positive well, when um, you issues had in this. Your, when you had your behind closed doors secret meeting with uh, the NDP, uh, we see in response that uh, Al Sutherland attended that meeting, but who in the PMO sat in on that meeting with officials in the NDP? Again, Mr. Chair, it was such a secret meeting at a great pizza place on Metcalf that we posted it on Twitter. Um, but uh, Referring to the meeting on January 25th, where uh, the chief electoral officer, among others, met with 
officials in the NDP. And the question we had asked was, who in the PMO, who in your office was at that meeting, if anyone? There's 15 seconds left. So, uh, again, I, Mr. Sutherland addressed that. He was at that meeting. Uh, by recollection, I think the meeting took place in my office in the Confederation Building. There was nobody from the Prime Minister's office in that, in that meeting. I certainly don't have a recollection of that. I was working with uh, a parliamentarian from another caucus who shared our objective in preparing this legislation, and we were lucky to benefit from the nonpartisan advice. Um, of both senior public servants and Elections Canada. Um, there's no mystery. I, the Conservatives find it shocking that people would work together to try and improve our electoral system. Um, I don't think Canadians find it shocking that parliamentarians would work together to strengthen our democracy as opposed to try and vandalize it like Mr. Cooper okay. would do. Okay, thank you very much, Minister. Uh